Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Arts Report. My name is Katla Osohoto and I have an incredible guest in studio with me today. Her name is Zuleika Patel. She's an anti-racism and social justice activist. She's also a new author of the book, My Coily Crowny Hair. And it actually sounds like a book that would be very relatable to someone like me and her. Black girl magic everywhere, I think. Zuleika, thank you so much, actually, for coming to studio and for being on the Arts Report. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I think it was back in 2013 where your life changed. 16. 2016. And you were 13. Yes. 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 And um, we'll talk about that specific event. But can you just take me through how your life changed after that year? You know, um, I think the changes were in me, like in terms of the life path, that was the major shift. And then here and there, there were other like, other shifts like in terms of how people perceive you as well as how um what you represent and how people perceive that yeah basically essentially how you're seen that changes the major shift is that was my entrance into social justice and from that point on i've been very active in human rights and social justice and anti-racism work and that was my own my own decision it wasn't like i felt obligated because of what i was already thrusted into yeah it was my own decision because of the mission and vision that i had which i saw would only be achieved in coming years like it would take time and i knew i wanted to be part of that and be there yeah and so i guess that that's where i could say the social justice and anti-racism activism journey started properly yeah This new book is such a beautiful culmination of your journey since 2016. And like I was saying to you before we hit record, I was saying, I wish I had a book like this when I was between the ages of five and 10. I don't remember there being a lot of books that had black girls that looked like me in them. I mean, we were reading things like Kathy and Mark. Jack and Jill. Jack and Jill. This book is so beautiful in that it gets little black girls and black boys seeing themselves represented beautifully from a young age. How long have you been working on this? So yes, this book actually really is a culmination of everything since 2016 because I wanted what was at the heart and center of the movement in 2016 to live on for centuries to come and for that message that we were advocating to be cemented into a book and documented into a book. And so it remains a permanent reference for a black girl child. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted proper documentation of the message that we were advocating at the time. And I started writing the book when I was in grade 11 in 2019. Wow. And then actually finished writing it properly in the beginning of this year. Yeah. And I guess that that journey with publishing, was it simple? Was it, did they contact you? Did you reach out? What did that look like? So what happened was I was contacted by Lingua Franca. Mm -hmm. And um, at the time, I remember the first thing that ran in my head was, why me? (laughs) Why me? But why not you? (laughs) And then that's what they said as well. Why not you? You're the perfect person (laughs) for it. Yeah. And then literally we met... Um, I met with my publisher at Woolworths Cafe in wow. Midland, Maine. And then that's where it all started in late last week of April yeah. in 2019. And then we, I probably started writing the book in May 2019. Yeah. And now two years, here it is in May. Yeah. This was always something I thought of. It was something I always wanted to do and something I always said that I'm going to do. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And it was always just that constant repetition of that phase. I'm going to do it. Mm. Um, and not I am doing it or I will do it. And then... When I was approached, I, I'm i one of those people who believe in things happen for a reason. Affirmations timing, and universal the timing. timing and yeah. yes. So I was like, so if not now, then when? And I guess I'm going to have to come to a point where I actually stop saying I'm going to do it. And I actually start saying I am doing it. Yeah. And so... I started writing it and I actually, the first thing I started with was conceptualizing the character. And that's how the story was able to flow out and be written. 
once the character was conceptualized and actually that's all that's i know that's not the normal yeah. way of writing you usually write first and then think about your characters later but for me i had to think about the character first because the character would be the representation of the book and yes. the character means something so deeply significant and the illustrations are beautiful i mean you. did you also think of what the character would look like yes I thought of everything, color scheme, everything. Yeah. And everything is very deliberate and intentional. The publishing journey, it had its own challenges in writing, given that in terms of my writing, my writing is, because is, I was a writer before, so mm -hmm. my writing was always radical and mm -hmm. spoke to a certain target market, yes. a certain age grouping. Which makes so, sense. So that it, was, it radical. was a bit of a challenge <laughs> for me to now bring it down to bringing down everything I've ever said, everything I've ever written about to make it relevant to a child mm -hmm. and basically bring that all to a child. Yes. And how do I bring forth a radical message of self-love, pan-Africanism, feminism as well? How the challenge was, how do I bring it to a child, a young child, like a little child, like between the ages of five and ten? Yeah. Without... Without saying it. Without saying it, yes. you know, but bringing it to them so that when they see it, they know it. and They live it. They, live they breathe it, it. They breathe it. Yeah. So that was the challenge, but it didn't last for long. Like, I had to actually watch a few cartoons here mm -hmm. and there, pick up the language, pick up what would what would um, make my writing my writing um, relevant to a child and interesting for a child and then read a few children's books and then yes. got the hang of it. And then now the bigger, greater challenge came in. So everything I do, how I live my life every day is a very intentional way. I mm -hmm. don't just, I don't just show up because, oh, it's great to show up or breathe because it's nice to breathe. Mm. I live a very intentional life and my life, my activism principles and values and my value system and structure are not separated from my whole life. Yeah. Like I, I've always made myself clear on black consciousness, pan-Africanism and being pro-black. And that's how I live my life all the time. Yeah. I'm pro-black in everything that I do, in what I consume, in who I work with, in who I partner with, in everything that I do. And I'm actually really proud as well just to just digress a bit yeah. that the minute you open the book yeah. to the first page where there's the acknowledgements, all of the names, well, majority of the names are names of oh, black women right down here from the publisher, contributor. So it's black people who are behind this. Yes. And it's not just an idea that the book is black, but then everyone else is white. No. You were conscious about that as well. And so I I, I worked with a um, a black owned and um, female led publishing yes. house, Lingua yes. Franca. And the challenge came in systemic yeah. racism, which is still prevalent in um, not just the country at large, because yeah. we, are, we are aware of that, but the publishing industry. And yeah. so there was that challenge of being undermined and because... Being um, taken for granted. Being taken for granted, being questioned yes. because you're dealing with two black women, like a young black female author, yes. a young black female publisher as well. But nonetheless, I knew that um, because of how I live my life and what are my life principles, that would be the route that I'm very deliberate in taking. And yeah. I'm prepared to ensure that it's a victory yeah, you know, tooth and nail. It's going and to it be a victory. And it is a victory. It is. I mean, just listening to what you're saying, it's so much wisdom. And I relate to you so much because I think so many black girls, whether we're intentional or not, we're all striving to be our best selves. And sometimes we have inspiration around us. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we're pushing against the grain. Sometimes doors are flung open for us. So, you know, what you're saying resonates because I think all of us are just trying to get there as well. And it's fantastic because I'm looking at you, though, even the way you're dressed and your hair is amazing. Oh, black owned, by the way. I can, it, yeah, you see? Sandy Mazibuko. Sandy Mazibuko. Fabulous okay. 
I'll keep a note of that. I mean, it looks amazing. Your hair is amazing. You've kept it natural. The character in your book, Natural Hair. The forward. The forward is from a natural is from a black woman. And that's Nomza Mombata. Let's talk hair care. Let's talk um mm-hmm. your hair. How do you take it? Because I'm sure wherever you go. People recognize you first with your hair, right? Am I lying? <laughs> no, you're not lying. You're yeah. Not. Oh, my word. So you got hair tips in here as well? Yes, we actually did. Um, we had a period of conducting conducting some research. Yes. Um, and just reading, asking questions, being on the lookout, just yes. researching. And then we were able to just summarize the research into short tips, actually. And this is for little black girls so that if they're taking care of their hair, they can... one thing as well, which is pushed in the book, is radical self-care and self-love. Right. Because I think that isn't a conversation that's had far too many times. And we're also conditioned to not look after ourselves Mm. with care and gentleness and love. One thing that I absolutely, absolutely am not fond of is um, the way people depict how black hair should be combed, the with the comb and you, you need know, to stretch violent, it out. Yes. The violent combing, you know. Yes. And I think that that I've always drawn a correlation and a link to um, the fact that there's always been violence placed on a black person's body mm-hmm. and um, a black person's body has always been subjected to violence. And mm. so I've always drawn that link between the combing and the conditioning that combing needs to look like that and be painful when that's not the actual case. Where you can use your hands. Yes. Your yes. hands are a comb. Yes. And be gentle. You can, it you can have be to gentle. Be painful, yes. You know? So that's one thing that is addressed in the book. And so. Hair care for me only started properly in um, 2018 when I started discovering get out discovering salons where they weren't using a comb. But and before I started, that, in when we saw the pictures back in 2016, your hair was natural at the mm-hmm. time, and and that incident, if we want to go back to that, was all about your hair and about black girls' hair uh, at your high school. So what were you doing during that time? Were, was it, were you taking care of your hair? No, sp- I was, I yeah. was, but there was still that element of, I need to comb it, I need to comb it, mm. comb it, comb it. And then I can only say actually that um, proper self-love, like doing hair gently with love, mm. patience, only started in around 2018 where I actually also started doing my own hair. Like I wasn't going to salons frequently. And I was using my hands. Yes. And um, I was using the right products that were suitable for me. Yes. Um, so, yeah. And then I felt that I also wanted to put that messaging in a book that you really do not have to um, hurt yourself when mm. um, looking after your hair. And you know what's funny? I'm just listening to you as you're talking that hair care, we learn it from our mothers, for example. And because your mother would be most of the time the first person to handle your head. But there's these cute videos now on socials about dads taking care of their children's hair as well. So, I mean, in terms of hair care, I I don't actually blame my parents, for example, because maybe they didn't know any better. The fashion styles of her time, of my mom's time, were perms. There was chemicals. That was also the beginning of when the the... The The conditioning. Psychological conditioning was taking place. Like, um, we know that the 70s was the black consciousness era. But then what happened after the black consciousness era, going into the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, Mm. when bleaching was being advertised, Mm. relaxers were on peak early 2000s. They were. Bonding, wigs, no. Not wigs. Weaves. Weaves. Yes. The sewing on. (laughs) The sewing on. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Yes. I also wouldn't say I blame them because, I mean, um, you have to look at the time and what was in the time. The time they were brought up in and what was in the time and what was happening during that time. Yeah. Because I find now with my my conversations with my mom, I mean, we're going through this natural hair care journey together. You know, whereas before I know as a kid, I wanted to relax my hair. Because I thought that that was the ideal thing. And I remember, you know, fighting my mom that I want to relax my hair. And I, you know, I wanted long, straight, flowy hair. Interestingly, let me tell you something. I also had a period where I had straightened hair. Yeah. Primary school, grade four, five, six. 
And um, that's when I went natural again in grade six. Yeah. So I did also go through that. Not many people know that I also w- went through that. The, the relaxed phase. The straightened phase. The wanting flowy hair and being so subjected Putting to... Putting the towel on your is, head, pretending like you have long hair. I don't know if is, you did that. I, yeah, <laughs> I did. But I actually started straightening in grade four and I was like, no... This is how I'm going to fit in. It's, yes. It, it's what makes people respond to me well and speak to me well. And I was yes. very defensive. No, this is what I want. And that's it, yeah. you know. And then I only came back to myself in like about grade six where I was like, no, I don't like it. And mm. I want my natural hair. Yeah. Uh, Zuleika, I remember when we met at Lily's Leaf, the National Heritage Site, and it was a few, I don't know if it was one or two years. It was, one it year. was a year after 2016. But early in 2017, yes. so a couple of months. Look, your memory is so <laughs> great. And I remember at that time, I, I just remember seeing a young girl who was quite passionate about her activism. There was a hint of anger there as well. <laughs> and It's still there. It's it hasn't, still, gone, it away. hasn't gone away. Okay, okay. And I remember thinking, wow, I hope that flame inside of you never dies. Have you been able to sustain that passion inside of you in terms of your political views? And have you just now refined it properly as you've gotten older? Mm -hmm. So are are your views still the same as they were back then? Oh, definitely they are. They are. Um, And that fire is still burning even brighter now, even yeah. brighter. I think the furnace, the furnace is not is not getting cold yes. at all. It's still there, and the reason why it's still there is because number one, um, I'm I will always be inspired by other young activists around me. Right, globally, more and more young people are speaking and taking ownership of the world and community they live in and are saying that they cannot be left out Mm. they cannot be left behind and so i'm inspired by that to continue because i know i'm not alone there's so many others from cape to cairo cairo to new york there's so many others who i've even connected with you know internationally and because there's still injustice in the world yeah um and Injustice anywhere in the world threatens justice anywhere. And so my views are still the same on anti-racism, decolonization, feminism, radical black feminism, South Africa in our post, post-apartheid post democratic dispensation, my mm. views are still the same. And on youth unemployment, they're still the same. Mm. And on Palestine, just to touch on that, yeah. um, my views are still the same. I think um, over the years, my views have gotten stronger. One of my um, principles of life is always to learn education. Like um, there's a quote by Malcolm X, which yeah. it's the first quote in my diary, when you open my diary, like is this my your personal diary. journal? No, 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 no. no, no. The <laughs> diary, diary, daily diary. Di- da- it, so this is an important quote because yes. it's in the daily <laughs> diary. So it has to be there with the planning of my days. So when you open it, I've written um, a quote by Malcolm X called "Education is the pa- is is a passport because the future belongs to those who prepare for it." Mm. And so one of my life principles is to be educated and to always acquire knowledge. And the hack is to not just acquire it, but um, implement it, implement it Mm. and use it, but not just theoretically know it. Understand it. Understand it and recite it, but apply it. Apply it to your life. Application is the hack. And so that's one of my principles, to educate and to be educated as well and to radically educate myself, like not just um, stick to the confines of a classroom or a lecture a lecture, but to read beyond that. I can't that. even actually say a lecture room, but like a lecture online virtual room. Yes. Um. But yeah. So, um. In terms of that, like, there's been learning constantly and going deeper into researching and um finding the archives and learning deeply and thinking deeply about humanity, the world, and injustice and where it stems from and understanding mm-hmm. the root to truly understand how we've come to this p- point where the seed has sprouted. Yeah. And now you're dealing with the plant that is above the surface of the ground. Yes. And so to understand the root as well and understand the seed 
that sprouted yes. this whole entire thing. And so my views have gotten refined through educating myself more and um, also sharing views and educating others and engaging, you know. Mm. I think the most powerful form of education is engagement with people that aren't like you. Mm. And so, um, especially with Palestine, I think my views, I was born into a political house, so my solidarity from the time I could speak was always with Palestinians because yes. that's what I've been taught. But then um, I think in about 2017, when I was in grade nine, that's when I actually started to voice out my solidarity and actually say that I, as a social justice activist, I'm in solidarity with the young activists in Palestine. And even now, even till now, um, my views have gotten more refined as well. Mm -hmm. Like till now. Because you understand the layers. understand the layers You understand more. who who's playing what role. Mm. You Because now you can take it in. You can read news reports. You can understand when someone says this, then what does it mean? When... Understanding the layers and the intersections. Yes. And so even till now, till today, actually, my solidarity is still with the Palestinians and um, is even in like now my solidarity extends now to urging government to mm. end to cut all ties with Israel and mm. it begins in recognizing that Israel is an occupation and not a state or a democracy mm. it's an occupation and whilst the Palestinians are not free whose shackles are exactly like ours and are intrinsically the same we will never be free for whilst anyone still has shackles that intrinsically look like ours yeah. we will never be free that's where it's at right now and you know even now i actually do want to actually say that we need more people speaking about palestine and um pushing for um boycotts, disinvestment and sanctions to end the apartheid. And even it's so important that the first thing we do is correcting the language. It's not religious conflict. It's not clashes. Mm. It's apartheid. It's occupation. It's colonialism. It's imperialism. And it's global militarization. So we cannot continue to use such language um, because we're at a point whereby we can't afford to be silent. Yeah. You know? And, you know, talking about the issue of Palestine, I think I was watching a video on Al Jazeera before the building was bombed. A journalist was talking to a 10-year-old little girl, just reflecting on the building behind her that had just been bombed. And she was saying, you know, at the end of the day, these adults are fighting, children are suffering, we're, we have to die. And... I think when we I think when you're talking about it, I always imagine that at the heart of it is people, is young children. Yes. Uh, it's lives. It's people Humans. with it's human beings with it's faces, humanity. yes. And they have lives and they have identities. And you know, you've sort of what's happening now the generational trauma that's going to come from that. It's mm. already there, but it's going to be even worsened. You know, when you think of Palestine, I imagine you're thinking about the faces. You're thinking about... It's not numbers. It's not numbers. That are yes. Being, like, I think we tend to separate humanness from reports, articles. Yes. In an article, you see statistics, so you think it's numbers. But you don't and it's easy to dismiss think, it. Yes, but you don't actually think that these are people, like living people with lives, identities. Mm. These are lives that when they're gone, they're never coming back. And they weren't supposed to go. They were taken, you know. Mm. Mm. So we can't afford to be silent anymore. We, we can't. It's actually not a thought. It's actually a statement that we can't yeah. afford to be silent anymore. Because even in us, our problem right now as a country is intrinsically the same as Palestine's. It's occupation, right? And we're battling the land question. Yes. You cannot separate the two. You can't separate the two. It's interconnected. Palestine's land question is exactly like our land question. You know, mm. and whilst anyone bears shackles that look like ours, we cannot be silent, you know. And I would even go on to further say that um, it's 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 so immoral of us to even have ties, investment ties with Israel. I battle with recognizing it as a state and a democracy because it's not. It's an occupation. It is. It so is. Yeah. And I just want to bring it closer mm. to home. Um 
So the specific incident that uh, you were involved in at Pretoria Girls High School in 2016 and the fight there not just being about hair but about an institution historically white dictating how little black girls should exist, should exist um, dictating their bodies. And essentially that's what it was about. But I imagine the the arguments now, I mean, like when you think about it now, were you cognizant at that age of the very depth of what mm. you were fighting even then? You know, interestingly, we never actually liked for it to be rendered to a hair matter. Mm -hmm. We didn't even like the the, the, the the labeling of labeling it as a hair matter because at the time what we fought and the language we used amongst ourselves at the time was not hair. We I, I can't remember a single day where we said we were fighting a hair issue. The language we were using was language of institutionalized racism. Yeah. This is about decolonization. This is about agency and existence as a black person having agency over your existence, yeah. which is something that has never, it has never been allowed for centuries. We see it goes as far as, 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 as Sarah Bartman not being able, and more so because it was, we, we were girls. So it's even deeper that, you know, there's a history to it of black girls, black women not being allowed agency over their bodies. And so, um, we actually, at the time, even till now, actually never liked the language of rendering it down to a, a hair, hair issue. issue yeah, it deals with one symptom of the main diagnosis, and the main diagnosis here is racism, institutionalized racism, and systemic racism, which is still attached to the DNA of the country and is still in the foundation of many institutions that are sh sanctioned by the state, mm. and so. We were talking language and using words like exclusionary and um, we must end the exclusionary practice. Yeah. And so we were never speaking in, in terms of hair only. We knew hair was a symptom, a big symptom as well. It's like dealing with, with um, COVID. When you deal with COVID, the biggest symptom is um, that you notice first is mm. your temperature, mm. you know. Mm. So hair essentially was like the temperature. Just the symptom, the yes. The temperature, but the diagnosis, you know. Yeah. Like when you have a... You, when you have a temperature now, they'll say it's COVID, you know. They won't say, oh, you have a fever. They'll say it's COVID, you know. We said the diagnosis was institutionalized racism, which has continued in a post-democratic era, era, which is um, aligned with the fact that um, what was once constitutionalized is now institutionalized. Yeah. It never ended. It ended by name. It ended by name and by a change in laws. But that's not enough. Because institutions operate in upholding culture and traditions. You know, it was stuff that was so common. You'd hear a teacher saying, you know, don't speak that language here. We can't hear you. And it was so common even amongst uh, my classes and, and the schools I went to that I don't remember being, I, I, I wish I was as radical as you were or as you all were back then. But I think, it, it, like you're saying, it becomes so internalized. You actually even forget that something wrong is happening here, mm. um, because if the and teachers, you're conditioned, you're, you're conditioned, taught, you're taught. That English is, yes. the, is, the, is the language of intellect. We're talking about um, some heavy stuff here, and I guess just to turn the conversation around. I mean, what do you do for fun? <laughs> <laughs> what do you do in your spare time? I like poetry. Yes. Um, I like, and this is, people always tell me it's very unexpected. I don't know how it's unexpected. Poetry? But you're a writer. I should expect that. I like art. Okay. Like painting. Um, yes. You know, I like painting. I Music. Um, yes, music. Solange. Solange is my home girl. Solange <laughs> is my home girl. You know, she once liked one of my posts. I was so like freaking <laughs> out on Twitter. Wait, you saw Saint Record. Yes, in with the blue tick. Yeah, ah. she liked one of my pictures on Twitter. I'll never forget that. I will literally, <laughs> my soul will leave my body here. But no, I, I went to watch her perform and I yes. think we made eye Afro contact. Afropunk. Yes, yes I yes, think yes. we, I am genuinely under the belief that we made eye contact. We're, you're sisters. We're sisters. We're yeah. homegirls. We're homegirls, yeah. <laughs> when you look back at Pretoria Girls High, have you been in touch with anyone ever since that um, incident? Are you still friends with some of the girls that you were in class 
with the teachers? Did you contact them? Have you spoken to them? Has there been any contact? You're asking a very uh, the reason why I'm laughing. Yeah, because <laughs> it's a serious one after all that kidding. <laughs> no, I'm laughing at another matter. What is that? Um, I don't even know if I should mention this on air, but I'm not allowed on the property. Oh my word! Um, Get out. At the time, at the time, I was the youngest in the movement because I was 13 going on 14. You were in grade, in grade eight, 8, yes. And all the other members of the movement were in grade 11 and matric. Yes. So they matriculated before me. I only matriculated last year. Yeah. And I essentially, because I was thrusted into the forefront as well, my name was the name that was um, publicized, right? I was an easier target, a simpler mm. target. And because I was young as well, and I would essentially be the remaining one after everyone leaves. Did you I finish became, your schooling there? Yeah, I did. And exceptionally well. Yes, I just girl. have to put that on air. Because yes. many times I've gotten scrutiny from, from um, the outside, right? Usually it tends to be white men, but mm. um, that how am I and academics? Gives them agency. How are my academics looking? Oh, I'm, wow. I'm loud. I'm loud. I'm always busy. I'm a loud vessel. My academics, just to put this on air, look very well. I matriculated with a bachelor's degree. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. A bachelor's degree endorsement. So wow. even now in first year, my academics look very well. And we're happy for you. I would just That's like to amazing. put this just <laughs> just just, you know, just for the just for the, the, the chirpers, you for, know. Yes. I've never gotten less than a sixty five in a test in varsity. Wow. Yeah. You go, girl. Yes. That's so nice. <laughs> Just to bring it back. Um, yeah, I, it's, you know, it's a very, it's a very close part in my life. Like, mm. I, even if I turn 30, I don't think I, I would ever separate myself from that. Like, it's just one of those that will always just hold its own place in my life. Yeah. So I, I'm still in contact. I'm still in contact with, with someone who was also at the forefront, like, I wouldn't m mention names, but mm -hmm. if you look at the photos, just properly, specifically photos in front of the white guards. Yes. Someone on the left, still in contact with her. Um, in fact, we're, we're like sisters. Yeah. So even though she matriculated in 2016, she still like looked out for me, kept in contact with me. She was part of accompanying me, the people that accompanied me to go fetch my matric statement wow. earlier in the year. So... Yeah, we're still in contact. And I mean, you would have finished last year because you're doing first year this year. Mm -hmm. That's incredible because it feels like such a, it feels like such a long time ago, but it wasn't that long. Time flies. Time flies, yeah. yeah. And I am still in contact with um, some of my educators that okay. were more on the radical side. Okay. Because... I think that one of the one of the things that happened was that there was a lot of focus on the peak and what was happening in 2016 and yeah. after the report and everything after, just died after the, the policy was changed yes there wasn't much of a focus on what was happening afterwards you know there was a bit of a focus that came like last year in mm -hmm. June just slightly but not really in depth you know mm. and there's been a lot of issues that I think that once all parties get to a stage where all parties are ready to speak I think that that's yeah. going to be a thing on its own to really talk about the aftermath because the aftermath essentially, I think I'd term it as more hectic than, than what happened. Prior. Yeah. So, but I think that once all parties are prepared to speak, then there will be that moment to yeah. really talk about that because I do think that that's a story that needs to be told. But I am still in contact with the teachers that were more on the radical side that really supported, um, Pupils, you, yeah. myself, yeah. um, in supported me in navigating all five years of high school. Like after the that. four years that was remaining, you know, ensuring that um academically I wasn't left behind, ensuring that there was actually someone to look after me and look out for me. Because it could I have never easily gone wrong. Not could have. It, it would did. have. It did. It did. It did, you know, but um, I can't say I was ever alone. I was never alone. Okay. You know, I had people there. So I'm still in contact with them, still in contact with um, my history teachers. I had um, phenomenal history teachers that yeah. were very, very radical women, you know, so I'm still in contact with each each one. 
still in contact with even some of the girls that are still there. But um, yeah, I'm just not allowed there. So Zuleika, in the next five years, I guess this is just my final question. I mean, the the world is your oyster, literally, <laughs> because you've got the ball rolling. You've got this amazing book out. You're doing incredible work. Any plans? You, you want to finish your studies? You have certain goals you'd like to achieve in the next five years? Yes. Um, actually, let's say six, rather. Mm -hmm. Okay. Six, seven. Okay. Okay. Six, <laughs> seven is the time that this goal requires. Okay. Definitely next. Um, I don't say this much, but one of my biggest inspirations is the late advocate George Bezos. Bezos. Yes. Um, so I'm actually, um, I intend on taking the human rights law route and oh, the wow. constitutional law route. Yeah. So um, definitely becoming an advocate mm -hmm. and still sticking in line with um, social justice and anti-racism work and human rights, but just doing it through the legal the legal side and mm. fighting fighting the courtroom battles. So that's definitely an aspiration and a goal mm. that's um, to be achieved. I'm not going to say hopefully. It, it is will happen. To. It will happen. Um, you know, I think that the book is also just the testament to that's shown me that anything is actually possible because um, I had a lot of turmoil in grade 11 just with school and mm. being there. Mm. And I think that deliberately so things were made harder for me as I was reaching my exit from the institution. But the book is a testament for me that anything is possible regardless of whether whether life is falling apart, whether things are not working out, but it it will happen, you know. Mm. So And and what you're saying is so true that breakthrough just as things get harder, the mm. breakthrough is almost That's a goal. There. That's a goal. That's the next goal. Okay, well there are other short-term goals that yeah. come before that, but that's the more longer-term goal. So I'm definitely going to take that route. You know, we wish you all the best. And yeah. more books are coming in yes. the next year and the year after that, the year after next year as well. Nice. There's going to be more books, um, which I've started already working on. And I don't like necessarily talking about all my plans. Yes. One more. Just maybe. Just maybe. Actually, not maybe. Yeah. Soon. A foundation. Just soon. Nice. Soon. Well, we wish you all the best, Suleika. Thank you are you. most deserving. And uh, congratulations on what you've achieved and the struggles you've been through. Like you say, this book is a testament to your life's journey. And we wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. And that was Zuleika Patel. As you heard from her, she's doing amazing work. And uh, we wish her all the best on her journey. And uh, if you would like a copy of this book, you can go to CNA, is it? Yes, it's yes. 150 rand. 150 CNA rand at CNA Nationwide. Nationwide. And you can get the book there. I'm going to get myself a copy.